typically uh, generous uh, introduction and good afternoon. A pleasure for me to be invited to address this conference again. I was invited, uh, I think, some time ago, but let me tell you, we accept any invitation to get out of the Westminster bubble at the moment. <laughs> um, but I've been particularly looking forward to this one. Just last week, we marked Armed Forces Day as thousands of people Literally thousands came together from Cleethorpes, where I attended with the Prime Minister, to Care Philly and places in between to applaud as members of the public the immense contribution of our army. In a few days' time, local communities up and down the land will gather once more, this time not in celebration, but in commemoration as we mark 100 years on from that immense battle fought in the trenches of the Somme. Today's troops might be our worlds apart from their World War I counterparts in terms of firepower, technology, and protection. Yet they do share the same commitment to service, the same passionate belief in the values of our nation the values of justice and tolerance and freedom that are worth fighting for now as they were worth fighting for then. And they do have to be fought for now. 100 years after the Somme, those values remain under attack. From Islamist extremists who most recently wrought havoc in a concert hall in Paris, in a nightclub, in Orlando, from aggressor states like Russia continuing to menace the Ukraine, from rogue nations like North Korea keeping rattling that nuclear saber. But just as our forefathers did a hundred years ago, today we face those dangers head on. Last year we had almost 80,000 British soldiers deployed on more than 380 commitments in 69 different countries around the world. This year, our troops have maintained that relentless pace. Today, they are training tens of thousands of Iraqis and Kurds to counter Daesh. They're assisting Nigerian forces to take on Boko Haram, and they're providing essential support to our Ukrainian allies as they stand firm in defense of their nation's territorial integrity. Our personnel, our service people around the world are making a difference and they deserve our heartfelt thanks. It is through their service that they remind us that if we're to continue protecting our own people, projecting our influence, promoting our national prosperity, then we have to have a strong army out in front leading the way. Now, not so long ago, Markham, there were some who questioned this government's commitment to the army. In fact, I now recall standing at this very lectern a year ago, fielding a barrage of questions, polite but firm, about uh, forces being hollowed out, budgets being constrained, and continual retrenchment. Barely a week after that conference, and of course because of that conference, the Chancellor announced that we would not only meet our 2% NATO target, but that our budget would grow for the first time this April in real terms and would go on growing for each of the next six years. And as you have said, a few months after that, the Strategic Defence Review decisively put us back on the map by investing in stronger defence in the shape of Joint Force 2025, an air group, a maritime task force, and a land force made up of 112,000 regulars and reserves able to deploy more rapidly an expeditionary force of around 50,000, 20,000 more than the equivalent review a 
full five years before, and committed over the next five years to spend some 12 billion pounds on the Army's equipment program alone, some 28 billion over the next 10 years to 2025. That additional resource will give us now a warfighting division optimized for high intensity combat operations, including two new strike brigades able to deploy over longer distances. It will give us reconfigured infantry battalions who will increasingly contribute to countering terrorism and building stability overseas. And it will give us firepower to match that additional manpower in the shape of digitally enhanced Ajax armored vehicles, mechanized infantry vehicles, warrior fighting vehicles, challenger tanks, upgraded Apaches and Chinooks, and cutting edge remotely piloted air systems. And I can announce today that we've signed an 80 million pound support contract with Thales that will keep our watchkeepers flying high for years to come, helping in the pro pro process to sustain 80 jobs and more in the supply chain. So we know now from the SDSR what our future force will look like. But the questions for today go much deeper and they return us, as you said, Malcolm, to the theme of this conference, adaptability. How should the Army adapt to a much more complex age? How can we make sure, as you've already been discussing in earlier sessions, that the Army does have the ability to react to such a wide range of threats, whether simultaneously from the east or the south, whether from conventional or from cyber warfare. In answering <coughs> that question, I would like to set out my vision of Army 2025. In my view, it should be a future force with three essential characteristics. First, it should be an integrated army. I don't mean an army structure that's better integrated. I don't mean an army that's better integrated with the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. You're already doing that. I mean an army that is integrated with the whole of government. Increasingly, the threats we face transcend departmental boundaries. Tomorrow's army is going to be working more closely than ever before with the intelligence agencies, with the police, with the Home Office, to deter and respond to threats. It'll be joining up with key government departments to support national resilience, contingency planning. It will be building stability overseas by improving our partners' abilities to deal with terrorism, radicalization, and extremism. Now, the Army, of course, has always been more than simply a blunt instrument. It's always been an organization with the skills, the intelligence, and the on-the-ground knowledge of how to make as well as how to break. And having fully absorbed CGS's doctrine note on integrated action that he released last year, I want to see Army 2025 fully utilizing its in-depth expertise, not just in theater, but at the heart of our government, helping to shape and inform the decisions that are taken in government. Secondly, I want to see Army 2025 dominate, not simply enter, dominate the information space in the way that the Army currently masters the physical terrain. We can already see now our adversaries waging war differently, using cyber to take down infrastructure, using social media to spread disinformation, using chat groups and rooms to radicalize followers. The army of the future will be plugged into the digital age. It will be able, in the words of those tech experts over in Silicon Valley, to translate the virtual bits into physical atoms that emerge from multiple receptors, whether they're digital tanks, carriers, or the F-35. And it will have the capability to deploy that real-time information, to disrupt and dismantle our adversaries' capabilities, 
to help inform political decision making and to deliver, above all, a faster truth to our public. So just as the pioneers of air support and tanks were to be found in the later stages of the Battle of the Somme, so the pioneers of information warfare will now be found amongst the men and women of 77 Brigade and 1st uh, Reconnaissance Brigade. They're already learning ways to improve information, to influence capabilities that counter hybrid warfare techniques and that improve battlefield intelligence. And along the way, they are pioneering techniques that will undoubtedly be turned, taken up throughout the rest of the army. They're discovering how to use more flexible terms of employment so that we can do more to tap into the deeper wells of talent within our country. They're breaking down barriers in the way we organize ourselves so that our intelligence analysts receive the information from unmanned aerial systems more swiftly and they're finding out how to give our deployed forces even greater access to the additional expertise and services that UK assets can provide worldwide. I believe that, that impact will in time be revolutionary. Third, Army 2025, as Malcolm reminded us from the SDSR, will be international by design. Thanks to the Army 2020 refined program, we will be a force to be reckoned with, with a full array of capabilities to operate alone if required. But we will also be in a much better position to work together with our global partners. And make no mistake, regardless of the result of the referendum, we will remain a major international power with global responsibilities. Leaving one particular union means we will have to work even harder at our commitment to others and to our key bilateral relationships. We will continue to be leading members of NATO, of the United Nations Security Council, of the Commonwealth, of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, of the Northern Group of European Nations, of the Five Power defense arrangements in the Far East of the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. And we will continue to be a country with strong and valued defense relationships with the United States and with countries around the world. The result of the referendum does not change our global outlook. We will continue to fight terror with our partners to support counter-migration efforts, whether organized by NATO or the European Union or the United Nations. We will continue to tackle counter-arms smuggling. We will continue to deepen and broaden those relationships we set out in the strategic review last year. And that's why Army 2025 is being configured to operate predominantly in combined formations as part of NATO's VJTF, which we lead next year, as part of our joint expeditionary force of Northern European nations that exemplifies that combined formation. In each case, exemplifies the sort of relationship that being international by design will forge and sustain. So Army 2025 will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with our American allies, building on the strength of our existing partnerships, building on the regular joint exercises between our nations, and the recent agreement to integrate more effectively a UK division into a US core, and the fact that we're one of the few armies in the world able to match the tempo of the US higher headquarters. And that's why Army 2025 will also be there alongside our French colleagues. And this year, we're not just looking back to Anglo-French efforts on the Somme, but looking forward with a successful testing of our combined joint expeditionary force. And beyond that, 
I want Army 2025 to be the partner of choice for smaller nations, giving us greater options for a sharper and speedier response against our adversaries. And that's a network that is being strengthened and expanded all the time through our specialized infantry battalions, through our culturally aware uh, regional specialists, through our world-renowned military courses, and the events that we hold, such as the conference we're concluding today. And above all, through the routine engagement of our troops throughout the year, throughout the world. This year, there have already been more than 100 such tasks, ranging from Belize to Burkina Faso, from Ethiopia to Egypt, from Sierra Leone to Singapore. Just this week, British troops have deployed again on exercise in the Ukraine. So that's my vision for Army 2025. And I need only add that this is a force whose diversity of allies needs to be matched by the diversity of its own personnel. By 2020, as you know, we want 10% of new soldiers to come from an ethnic minority background. We want more than 15% of them to be women. And we want them, in both cases, we want them there not simply to make up the numbers, not simply to meet a government target, but to bring their skills and their talents to every part of the army and to every corner of the world in which our people serve. These are the people with the talent that takes them to the very top. And this will be a force that represents the nation, that enjoys, as it did last week, the nation's wholehearted support, and a force that is admired worldwide for the values that it embodies. So let me conclude by saying that is the Army 2025 that I want to see in the coming years. A stronger, forward-leaning force, leading a more secure, more prosperous, and more confident country into the future. And though we don't know today when and where the British Army will be deployed next, I do know where it is deployed, it will be used successfully. Not just because of the building blocks that are already in place, not just because we are now putting our money where our mouth is, but above all because of the iron will and determination that once drove those heroes on the song to preserve the freedoms we cherish against forces of aggression and intolerance and injustice, because that determination and iron will remains after all these years, remains the driving force of our military today. Thank you.